Welcome back to Launchpad. I'm Christian Reddy and I've got words all over my face. Okay, so there we go again. <laughs> and we go back and now we are good to go. Welcome back to Launchpad. I'm Christian Reddy, your friendly neighborhood astronomer, and I am also your host tonight for our monthly planetarium show because in my day job I'm also a prof uh, you know an instructor at Towson University and I teach astronomy and I even run a planetarium show. At least I'm supposed to, but, you know, we got this whole thing going on. So, you know, we're just going to do it this way instead. We're just going to do this online, which is really great because we're able to talk about the kinds of things that I really like to talk about. And what's really fun about this, uh, you know, getting a chance to talk to you guys uh, each month is that, you know, I didn't know last month what we were going to talk about this month. But last month we were talking about the Giant Magellan Telescope, which, by the way, I'll just show you. I've got a model of right here. Remember we were talking about this big beast that's being built down in Chile? Well, one of the things this is going to be used for is to explore quasars. Okay, now if you are of a certain age, you probably remember the old television manufacturer quasar. But no, we're talking about something. I mean, live streaming pros that doesn't look giant. Well, it's a model of a giant Magellan telescope. Trust me, uh, for scale... Uh, you be really small. Anyway, all right. <laughs> so, anyway, what I was saying is that one of the things that came up in our conversation last month about Giant Magellan Telescope is that it will be used to explore quasars. And then everyone's going all like, oh my gosh, I want to talk about quasars. And I said, hey, that's okay because my guy, Mike Brotherton, is a actually is one of the world's experts on quasars. And he's very graciously agreed to come and chat with us tonight. And the great thing about Mike, there's actually a lot of cool things about Mike, but I'll just say, I'll just summarize a few things here for you. Number one, he's not just a scientist. He's not just an astrophysicist, but he's actually way cooler than that because he is a science fiction author. He is the author of Star Dragon and Spider Star. And not only does he uh, like astronomy and not only does he like writing science fiction, but he wants to help the world make better science fiction. And that's why he created the Launchpad Astronomy Workshop for Writers. And that's how Mike and I met because uh, I, I uh, fooled him into inviting me. And this is the guy right here. This is my, my friends, my main man on the main sequence, Dr. Michael Brotherton. Good evening, Mike. So glad to have you here. Hi, Christian. It's great to be here virtually. It's great to be anywhere during the pandemic. It sure is. And through the power of uh, our technology, we can we can be everywhere in the world right now. It's actually kind <laughs> of a wonderful rev revelation. He, it is cool that we can do this, right? And and uh, and hopefully the internet will stick around for a few more years, and it's not just a passing fad. But you know, Callie here, I think she has it right. What a baddie, yes, sir, and friends and ladies. He is, and oh, right out of, right out of the gate, just gotta say. A huge thank you to Construction Cro Cronies Chris from our man up in our man up in Canada. He gives us Canadian twenty dollars. Thank you so much, man. It's very generous of you. And and hey, folks, listen. Super chats are always welcome. Uh, we'll try to get to all of your questions, and we'll certainly try to make a priority for super chats. However, look, if you are a student of mine, remember you are by definition broke, and therefore you don't put super chats in you just put questions in if you want you could just say student and you know i'll try to give you a little extra priority but in any event thank you very much chris it's super generous of you so mike i thought what we could do tonight is you know we were talking about quasars and uh we have a request for mike to turn up his volume let me let me see if i can turn up my volume actually not my volume mike's volume uh mike can you just say hello for a second just a quick how you doing a quick how you doing Okay, I hope that's a little bit better. I hope he's uh, coming up, uh, coming in a little bit clear. Anyway, so, uh, Mike. I can also use my classroom voice. <laughs> moderation. I suppose so, right? Yeah, and uh, it's it's so great to see so many people coming in tonight. Hello, Alex Chambers. Great to have you. One of my one of my one of my students, one of my best and brightest, or maybe it's one of your best and brightest, Mike. I don't know, but uh, Mike's a professor as well. So let's go ahead and and just Mike, really quick. Let's just talk briefly about you know we're here to talk about quasars, but I know the answer to this question. But I love if you could talk about 
just what is a quasar? And, and also, how did you decide of all the things in the universe to explore and study, what drew you to quasars of all things? Okay, um, Christian, if you want to bring up uh, my slide, I, I have a slide about this. Um, let me tell you just a, a real brief story. I was on an internet forum about 15 years ago, You're having really constructive discussions, right, as one does on the internet. But uh, I had a small disagreement with somebody about uh, some basic principle in science. I don't even remember what it was, but he said something about how he knew lots about science. He'd taken astronomy in college. Uh, and he challenged me, do you even know what a quasar is? He didn't know I was a world expert on quasars. And I said, <laughs> yeah, I know all about quasars. I'm a world expert on quasars. And my profile wasn't anonymous. He could link through and everybody saw that he had just stepped in it. Uh, so people don't throw you the uh, the big fat easy to hit softball right over the middle of the plate very often. But, so uh, so was it did. like was he basically saying, "Hey, do you even quasar, bro?" Is that what he was trying to say to you? It was pretty much like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and you know, but the purpose of the science is is to understand what a quasar is. Right. And we're still learning, and it's research. So we understand, I think we know what a quasar is, but we don't understand a lot of details about quasars. We don't understand how they influence the evolution of the galaxies they live in and so forth. But let's, let's get to what is a quasar. And the, the name quasar, first to start off, comes from an abbreviation of the term quasi-stellar radio source. So it's a something that you pick up with a radio telescope, uh, at least initially, uh, about 90% of quasars are not actually very loud radio emitters. Uh, but the first ones identified were, and they're quasi-stellar in the sense that they look like stars. They look like blue stars when um, you get an optical telescope on them. And uh, the very first one really identified as a, as a quasar or QSO is another abbreviation, quasi-stellar object. Was this object called 3C273? Comes from the third Cambridge radio catalog, object number 273, very bright in the radio, and uh, about a 13th magnitude star is what it looked like optically. 13th magnitude um, is way too faint to be seen with the naked eye, but you can see it with relatively uh, small telescopes. So just to clarify, so, so with magnitudes, you're saying that's like a numerical system that we assign just to identify the brightness yeah. of a star, right? Okay. So what, how's it works? Yeah, so the, lo the lower the number, the brighter it is? Yeah. The, the, Greeks, uh, the Greeks looked up and said, okay, um, the first, first magnitude are bright stars. Second magnitude are not quite as bright. Third magnitude are fainter. <laughs> um, humans can see about to fifth or sixth magnitude. It's kind of mm. a logarithmic system. Um, so every five magnitudes is a factor of 100 in flux. So this object is, is uh, quite a bit fainter than you could just go out and see with, with your own eyes. So these are objects that are kind of obscure in the sky. And we're talking about this object being found uh, in the middle of the 20th century. So it's not like astronomers have known about it for forever. Um, kind of a relatively new discovery in terms of 20th century astronomy. Now, when you zoom in on this object that looks like a blue star, you see that there's a little something poking out the side that looks kind of strange, right? Yeah. Okay. So there's a little, there's a little tail, right? It kind of looks almost like a, like an overexposed Q. Yeah, it does. Q for quasar. Ah, Q okay. Q and on. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> we won't talk tonight about what Q and on is. That's a different. Oh, uh, good. That's a different YouTube channel. Um, 
but that's kind of unusual, but you have to get a good image of that to notice that right away. What really stands out when you go look at 3C273 hmm. is the spectrum. Okay, if a picture is worth a thousand words, a spectrum is worth a thousand pictures. And they had photographic plates back in the day. Um, it was not such an easy observation to make. Uh, but when they took a spectrum of this object, it had these emission lines at very strange wavelengths. Wavelengths that were, th there were no elements that, that emitted at those wavelengths. So Martin Schmidt, 1963, finally publishes a paper. And he says, those lines are coming from hydrogen gas from an object that is moving away from us at 16% the speed of light. Wow. That's kind of crazy. That, that's really haul in the mail. Stuff. It is. Right. And the implication from the Hubble law, the Hubble law, the Hubble law's relationship Edwin Hubble discovered uh, and others of his time discovered that uh, says more distant objects are moving away from us faster and faster. So, uh, Mike, if I just could uh, ask a, a dumb question here, um, this is a, another representation of that same spectra that you showed earlier. You showed like the, the spectrograph, right? This is more like a spectrum plot. And those right. spikes that are coming up, those are emission lines, right? Which means that there's like extra stuff that this thing's shooting out that itself is also really bright and highly energized, correct? Yeah, it's um, kind of like a neon lamp in space, but right. instead of neon gas, it's primarily hydrogen gas that okay. gets uh, ionized and then in turn glows, emits radiation. So, uh, and, yeah, go yeah. ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I was gonna, I was just gonna ask. Uh, you mentioned something about a redshift, right? And I, uh, I see that these particular emission lines are noted and. They're important. You said that these belong to hydrogen, but um, you know, I, I think we. Uh, well, I was talking about this with my students in class one time about hydrogen emission lines, and they they seem like they're showing up at a bit of a longer wavelength than what they're supposed to, right? It's almost like they've been redshifted into a longer wavelength, right? Exactly. When we say something is moving away at sixteen percent light speed, uh, that corresponds to a Doppler shift, shifting to longer wavelengths. Hmm. So um, that that H alpha line on the right hand side of your plot, um, it's showing up at about 7,500 angstroms. Angstroms are the wavelength units on that on that graph. Okay. Um, but it should be at 65, 63 angstroms if it were at rest relative to us on wow. the telescope. So it's really been shoved into the red end of the spectrum, just like, and that's because this thing is moving away from us super fast. How much? How fast? 16% the speed of light. Yeah, 15.8. 15.8, okay. our red chip. All right, well, that's the that's good enough for government work, right? Red shift, it is. Uh, but the interpretation of those red shifts is that uh, this is the result of living in an expanding universe hmm. post-Big Bang. Oh. So cool. you use this Hubble law, this relationship between distance and velocity, to figure out that... This object, 3C273, is not local. It looks like a little blue star. It's relatively bright. It's what you would expect to see for a, a star in the semi-local region of our galaxy. But it's not in our galaxy. It's way beyond our galaxy. It's way beyond the nearest galaxies. It's uh, so far out there. I, I, have a, I have a slide here with too much text. But this is the implication uh, of this basic observation of 3C273. That redshift in the expansion of the universe implies that it is about two and a half billion light years away. Okay, Jeez. the Andromeda galaxy is a nearby galaxy two million light years away. This is a thousand times further away than the Andromeda galaxy. Wow, that is cool. And given that we see it's moderately bright too it's not bright compared to nearby stars but magnitude 13 is not super faint and it's incredibly bright for an object two and a half billion light years away 
it implies that hmm. this object, even though it's it's you know sort of an innocuous star-like object in our sky, mm -hmm. it's four trillion times more luminous than the sun. Jeez, amies. Wow. Trillion. So four That's trillion a, you know, times. Now, just again, putting. I'm trying to get my head around that because, you know, our sun is one times the luminosity of the sun. Duh, right? But the Milky Way galaxy has about 400 or give or take some odd billion suns in it. This right? is this is more luminous than the Milky Way galaxy. Way more luminous. We've gone from 400 billion up to 4 trillion. We've gone up a whole power of 10 in order of magnitude. Man, oh yes. man, that thing is luminous. Jeez. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a quasar. So they discovered these things in the 60s, and it was like, holy crap, what is that? We have no idea. Um, it's, this, it's this thing that looks like a little star. It's got some radio emission associated with it. But it's billions of light years away, and it's more luminous than, than galaxies. Entire galaxies. Wow. That's just And nuts. we had no idea. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's crazy. Oh, that's fantastic. Crazy. <laughs> um, now, I've got another okay. boring text-type uh, slide. So again, what's a quasar? So observationally, it is a bright star-like object, generally blue. And I say bright star-like, I mean, it's too faint to go out and see with your own eyes, but with a telescope, you can make it out. But it's a star-like object in the sky that is more luminous than galaxies. And they're far away, generally or they would be very obvious in our sky. So there were a lot of papers in the 60s, a lot of confusion. We had these enigmatic quasars. What were they? And now we associate them with supermassive black holes. And by supermassive, I mean anywhere from millions to billions of times the mass of the sun. Wow. Wow. Okay? And so, again, so, our, our, our galaxy has a supermassive black hole in it, but it's about 4 million times the mass of the sun. At the center of that glowing thing is a black hole. How many? We're 4 million in the Milky Way. How many are you talking about, Mike? So, the Milky Way would make kind of a pathetic quasar. Oh, okay. Just because it's supermassive black hole, uh, a few million solar mass as a material. Uh, the Milky Way is a, a big galaxy in the local group, but it's not a very big galaxy in the grand scheme of things. Bigger galaxies, turns out, have bigger black holes. Now, the reason originally put forward by Donald Lyndon Bell in the late 60s that uh, seems to be the right idea, and we've got a lot of evidence it's the right idea, is that you can get a lot of energy due to the intense gravity of a black hole. We know if you drop something down a hill, it gets to the bottom of the hill, it's moving pretty fast. Okay? What makes things roll downhill is gravity. Now, if you drop something into a black hole from some large distance, by the time it gets to the black hole, it's going really, really fast. Okay? Now, in order to get the energy out, it can't just vanish into the black hole and be lost. But the thing is, it's really hard to drop something into a black hole the same way it's hard to drop something into the sun. There is this idea that, oh, we should just launch our garbage into the sun. Uh, the sun's a hard place to reach energetically. Um, we have orbits. We have something called angular momentum. Um, your material is going to be moving around that black hole unless it is slowed down so it can drop in. So you basically have to um, lose that angular momentum somehow. So, so, so gas that, that is driven into the centers of galaxies and approaches 
these supermassive black holes, generally it's not gonna fall in. It's going to come in um, and it's going to orbit in some way. And this orbiting gas forms a disk around that central black hole. And it's moving at thousands and thousands of miles per second, tens of thousands of miles per second. Uh, and this gas heats up. Um, we, we know um, spacecraft like Apollo or fast moving aircraft, faster than the speed of sound, they, they interact with that, uh, that gas and they heat up. Well, we have solar system sized disks of hot ionized plasma swirling down into these supermassive black holes. And the black hole themselves is black, it's dark, the, the light doesn't escape from it, but that big accretion disk of material, we, we use the term accretion disk, it's a gas accreting onto the black hole, is basically like uh, the conditions in the surfaces of stars, but it's got a huge surface area compared to a, a star, and it's these disks that outshine the galaxies they live in when you have a truly massive black hole at a high enough accretion rate, that is, that disk is big enough. Um, they're just amazing. Um, they outshine the whole galaxy. I'd say that's an understatement, Mike. <laughs> just, you know, completely mind-bending. It seems like, uh, you know, so it, it is remarkable how we think, how we're conceiving of black holes like quasars have really forced us to redefine what we think of as black holes oh black holes are black you can't see anything well that's still true they don't radiate but in the right environment man they can they can generate a tremendous amount of energy that can be seen from across the universe that is truly remarkable and and we get to then use them as probes of, mm. of the universe um, you can do these big surveys and you can pick out the quasars and they're tracing the most massive galaxies and large-scale structure <laughs> and there are lots of things that we can do with that um, you can also use them as as light bulbs distant light bulbs and see intervening gas and absorption that you it's cold gas between galaxies um, and this is the only way to spot it is is by having this this background lamppost to see it against so they're 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 interesting super interesting, extreme objects with some of the most extreme physics that we know of in the entire universe. But they also let us probe the universe on these uh, huge scales because they are objects that we can see all the way back to cosmic dawn and the formation of the first stars and galaxies. Oops, excuse me, that's truly remarkable. I, you know, I'm just showing you a video here. Uh, this is not one of the quasars. I don't know, if, Mike, this is a quasar you studied, if this region of the sky looks familiar to you. <laughs> but uh, this is the, uh, looks like we're taking a very large telescope uh, observatory image of a distant quasar, and now we switch to an artist's impression. But uh, there you have it, right? So there is your, accre there's your gigantic disk at the center of this galaxy. So it's stuff from the galaxy just falling into the black hole, spiraling in, and this thing's getting really hot. Well, uh, as I said, it's, it's not so easy for things just to fall in uh, to a central black hole, or things in the solar system don't just fall into the sun. Right. Right? They're in orbits. There's angular momentum and, and so forth. And we think what, what happens to power these supermassive black holes and make them accrete and grow you got to shake things up, and it's probably the case, and, and we, we think pretty much every galaxy, every large galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center, hmm. but they're only active uh, as quasars when something disturbs that galaxy uh, and leads to driving some gas into the centers, and when I say some gas, to power a luminous quasar, we need solar masses of material per year. So it's got to eat about a star every year to shine wow. as a quasar. Wow. But that, uh, that is, kind of that's a lot of stuff. It, it's gobbling down. Well, you know, and they're not on all the time, mm. but they may be on for 10 million or maybe 100 million years. 
Um, and they may be intermittent during those kind of periods, but they will grow by tens of millions of solar masses when they're on the on phase. But if they're already a billion solar masses, that's not a huge percentage. Okay? Fantastic. Right. But they okay. may have different epochs of activity over the lifetime of the universe. So galaxies interact and galaxies merge and big galaxies cannibalize small galaxies. And it's probably these kind of galaxy interactions that lead to this gas getting down into the center uh, where the accretion just can form. So there is an intrinsic relationship between the evolution of galaxies and the growth and activity of the supermassive black holes within them. Um, let me show an image. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, and I was muted the whole time, and I apologize. Oh, here I was trying to, uh, well, Mike, while you're queuing up that image, I was trying to uh, read some comments and make sure that I was uh, gathering up the questions. I'm seeing a number of questions coming in, Mike, and I think what we'll do is uh, we'll try to get to a couple of those. And if you think it's something that we can talk about later, we can certainly table the question. But uh, first of all, if you are enjoying this, friends, Please, please uh, give it a thumbs up, uh, maybe tell a friend, tweet it out, maybe uh, say something about it on the Facebook or Twitters or whatever these interwebs are. But, uh, you know, we appreciate uh, you helping to spread the word because stuff's, I think this stuff's kind of cool, right? You know? uh, so we did have a few questions coming in. And by the way, I did want to take a moment and just thank a few very generous uh, super chats and super stickers. Uh, let's see, Callie earlier. Uh, and, and I love how Ecamm Live, the software that I'm using to stream, doesn't actually show the animated GIF. It just actually just describes it. So Shiba Dog happily massaging his cheeks with mouth wide open. I'm trying to visualize that. And I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't know. Anyway, happy dog. Thank you, Callie. It's very generous of you. I really do appreciate that. And uh, let's see. We um, uh, also had a couple of other questions. Uh, so... Uh, and if you are, by the way, oh, you know what else I keep forgetting to tell everyone? Oh, yeah, and Alicia Alred, thank you so much. Also, another, this time it's a Shiba dog clapping its hands. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. We like Shiba dogs here at Launchpad Astronomy, so thank you. Uh, incidentally, uh, I uh, you may notice, I mentioned Launchpad Astronomy. You may notice that my title is Launchpad Astronomy slash Towson University. Mike's title is Launchpad Astronomy slash University of Wyoming. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit as well. But there's a number of really cool questions, Mike. I was wondering if you uh, had a care to uh, address a couple of these. But the stuff that's in the picture of M87, but a couple of orders of magnitude more. Now, obviously, that goes back to, uh, I think, what you were describing earlier when you were talking about the mass and the luminosity of, of uh, the first quasar we, we talked about tonight, 3C273, correct? Yeah, so here, and uh, yeah. I'll, I'll come back to this issue of host galaxies in a minute. Uh, I have a slide about M87. And M87 uh, is this object you've probably seen pictures of uh, from the Event Horizon Telescope. It's this uh, image of the black hole, or at least silhouette of the black hole, against the radio light around it. Um, and that's uh, really quite an astounding uh, observation. Uh, we really see there is a black hole in the center of M87. M87 is an active galaxy, but not very active compared to the quasars. It has a mass of about uh, five or six times uh, sorry, five or six billion times that of the sun. So it's an extremely upper end, high mass black hole. Um, and there are jets that we can see coming out of it in the radio. But optically, it's not a very bright source. It doesn't seem to have a, a really bright, massive optical accretion disk around it. But probably at some times in its past, it did. And this led to the growth of this black hole. And at some time in the, in the distant past, uh, it was probably a very luminous quasar that perhaps some alien astronomers in some other parts of the universe are studying even now. So that raises a... Uh, so, yeah. I, I, 
Yeah, so I guess that kind of uh, dovetails into uh, this question that we just got from uh, Johnny. Uh, is, you know, since you mentioned that other civilizations may be looking back at us, maybe they're seeing a quasar. That's what Johnny was asking. Is there any evidence that the Milky Way galaxy, our own galaxy, was at a quasar perhaps back in the day? Um, it's very likely, and, and there is some observational evidence to suggest that uh, the Milky Way black hole has been more active in its past. Not at the level of one of these really luminous quasars, mm. but something uh, a step or two down from that we call a Seifert galaxy, where the central black hole is, is bright and luminous, but not so much it overwhelms the light from the entire galaxy. Um, and that corresponds to the fact that the Milky Way black hole is, is only about 4 million times the mass of the sun. And, uh, you know, we believe from simulations that the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way galaxy are going to merge in about 3 billion years. And this event is likely to lead to a merger of their black holes and a uh, gas accretion. So chances are the Milky Way will have a major episode of activity in several billion years and may well qualify as a quasar at that point. So we may uh, see... The, uh, yeah, so we may see something. We may see something like this happening. At least this is a, uh, a very much of a God's eye view of the impending merger of the Milky Way and uh, the Andromeda galaxies, right? So this is how we get to. Oops, sorry. Uh, this is how we get to the uh, Great Milkometa galaxy, as I like to call it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, this this brings us back uh, to a to a slide I, I had queued up here a few minutes ago looking at the host galaxies of quasars. Um, these really luminous quasars like 3C273 and, and others are, are hard to study in terms of the galactic environments they live in because they outshine the, the galaxies you know, by a factor of 100. It's hard to see the faint galaxy next to the bright glare of the quasar. But the Hubble Space Telescope uh, image quality is sufficient to do that. Um, on the left there, there was a study in the mid-90s. One of the things the Hubble Space Telescope was designed to do was to, to see the quasar host galaxies. And you can see uh, in this particular image evidence of, of galaxy interactions and things we call tidal tails um, that are seen in the uh, stages post-merger. Um, and on the right-hand side, uh, let me let me show off some of my Hubble Space Telescope data. I was studying a, a class of active galaxies called post-starburst uh, quasars, and some of them look like fairly normal spirals, but quite a lot of them are uh, interacting galaxies or elliptical galaxies that show evidence of recent interactions Oops. and merging. Sorry about that. I got the wrong so, one up here. I'll bring it. Me I'll get you. I'll get you back. That's all right. Um, there we are. So, so yeah, it's 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 pretty exciting that yeah. that we can um, image these things. Um, all of these images from the ground look pretty much like point sources, like stars, maybe fuzzy stars. Right. But the Hubble Space Telescope lets us see them in uh, pretty good detail. Yeah. Um, and these cool. are these are all objects that are um, like 3C273 at distances of several billion light years away or further. So they may not look as exciting and sharp as some Hubble images you've seen, but these are quite distant objects, billions of light years away, that we're able to see for the first time uh, in detail the host galaxies. And a lot of them are really spectacular. These interactions seem to lead to huge episodes of star formation, star bursts, that are major events in the evolution of a galaxy and accretion onto the supermassive black hole and that intense activity. And uh, the interaction between the supermassive black hole at the center, the quasar activity, and the evolution of the host galaxies has been a really exciting area of research over the last two decades. Mm. Mike, I just had one question, and uh, you know, we're used to seeing. You mentioned these are images from the Hubble Space Telescope, 
And I know that when uh, you know the, the Hubble Space Telescope press office gets a image ready for release, they've done a lot of work on the image and they really bring out a lot of colors. I'm not saying your images are, are horrible, but they're very red. And I'm, I, I thought I would ask if you could uh, help us understand why it's, they're all so red. So the program I had um, was to image these objects in one color, which was a red filter. And we were not looking for color information for this study, but morphological information. Were there interactions? Um, could we see tidal features? Could we see knots of star formation? And the answer is yes, you can. Uh, when I went back and asked for uh, images taken through other bands and other colors to map out star formation uh, ages and, and histories. Uh, I had trouble getting that program through uh, the review panel. <laughs> so um, we're left with these images that are one single color. Okay. Well, there you go. So with a, with a red color. Right. Not everybody gets to take multi-chromatic, uh, you know, RGB images and combine them together. But that's okay. You're only just figuring out. You really were trying to work out the shapes what the structures are like around those black holes, which not for nothing is pretty important. Yeah, and, and galaxies um, have a lot of red stars. Yeah. And they tend to be more easily seen against the blue light of the, the quasar in redder bands. So we, we got one color images. So uh, there's a uh, question here that may be uh, somewhat related to what you were uh, commenting on earlier, Mike, but uh, 28... Uh, Astatine asked, do quasars have a common course of evolution like stars, or does each quasar have its own unique life course? Galaxies and quasars are unique. Um, if you see the quasar, it means you've got accretion onto a supermassive black hole. And that accretion depends on, do you have the gas coming into the galactic center? And whether or not you have the gas coming to the galactic center depends on, in detail, the history of, of that galaxy and its environment and what it's interacting with. So we're still working out uh, the details of, of how this works. Uh, we, we think probably the quasar activity is pretty episodic. And um, the exact appearance of the quasar and its spectrum and so forth depends on things like how how high is that accretion and how much gas is coming in and uh it can flare up they're they're quite variable they get brighter they get fainter on relatively short time scales um but we we're just seeing you know we've only been observing quasars for decades um we're starting to see them turn on and turn off in some of these longer surveys. And the statistics imply probably um, they have short lifetimes of bright activity and they can fade away and then they can come back again as the uh, accretion picks up. So they can switch on, so, switch off, depending upon what happens. If there's anything falling into the black hole, it, it can go quasar. That's right. Right. Uh, so, and when they change, yeah. we call those changing look quasars or changing look AGN. AGN for active galactic nuclei. Okay, great. So then, then now you're talking, you know, obviously there's definitely a relationship between the quasar and the galaxy. I mean, it is the center of a very active galaxy. And, and Roger M. was asking, uh, could, whoop, let me try to bring it up here, try it again. Uh, Roger M. asked, could black holes form galaxies? I mean, yes, black holes so, swallow things, oh, but do they do they affect the evolution and formation of galaxies? They affect it, but uh, we've got some huge question marks on, on this topic. Mm -hmm. So first, these are supermassive black holes. We talk about something like a, a billion or even 10 billion solar masses at the upper end. But if you talk about it in terms of the mass of the galaxy they live in, it's like one one thousand. It's it's a uh, you know, tenth of a percent of the total mass. So in some ways, the black hole is inconsequential to the total. But we see ways in which the mass of the black hole is correlated very tightly with the mass of the galaxy. So in some ways, you may say, what's the big deal? Big black hole, big 
big galaxy, small black hole, small galaxy. But there is a relationship, and we don't know yet if the forming new galaxies start with a black hole in the center and the galaxies grow around it, or if the galaxies come first and the black hole forms in the center. That's still an outstanding question. Um, we hope to find more information from the James Webb Space Telescope, operating primarily at infrared wavelengths, mm -hmm. which are needed to study these objects in a very distant universe where all the optical and ultraviolet light gets redshifted out of the optical and ultraviolet and shows up at infrared wavelengths. So that dovetails perfectly into Johnny's question. Uh, you know, what, what quasar or quasars, I guess, since you seem to be kind of greedy with your quasars over here. I mean, look at all these freaking Hubble images of quasars. Which quasars would you like to investigate with JWST? And we're talking about the James the Webb Space Telescope, one. right? Yeah. And so why would the you move with this high? One. Right. Why would you go with the, why would you use JWST for those? So again, um, the expansion of the universe and the Hubble law tells us that the most distant systems in the early universe have the highest redshifts. And when I say high redshifts, I mean the wavelengths are not just 16% longer, like 3C273, but maybe factors of six or seven. So really huge amounts of, of redshift. And something, if we want to study the optical part of the spectrum, redshift of six or seven, that light goes into the mid-infrared part of the spectrum. And that is what the James Webb Space Telescope, J JWST, is designed to study. It is optimized not for the optical and ultraviolet, but for infrared wavelengths in part so it can study the early universe. So, uh, so then this is something about, uh, you know, and, and again, this is talking about go looking backward deep in time. You're going way back into the early days of the universe and about how many billion years after the formation of the universe or the, the Big Bang uh, would you say these quasars can take us? So, so it's a great point. Telescopes are time machines. We literally get to look back in time and see the universe when it was young, when we look at distant objects. So when we talk about these quasars having redshifts of six or seven, their, their wavelengths are shifted by these kind of factors. We're, we're going back to when the universe was several hundred million years old, less than a billion years old. And we think the universe today is um, approximately 14 billion years old. So this is, this is going back quite a bit. This is cosmic dawn, when the first stars were forming, the first black holes, the first galaxies, and the first quasars. And we want to know where stuff comes from, how it was formed, how it's evolved over time. That's what the Hubble Space Telescope JWST and NASA are trying to learn, and astronomers more generally. And the quasars play a big role in this. I can't hear you, Christian. Okay, now you can hear me, I bet, right? Yeah, that's what I get for trying to mute myself so you're not hearing me click and clack and all that kind of stuff behind the scenes. But Nicholas, thank you so much for the super chat. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And he asks, how would the night sky look if you lived in a galaxy with a very luminous quasar? Would a luminous quasar interfere with the life conditions in this galaxy? So I guess, would you actually be able to look at a quasar or would you be too busy being dead? So... It wouldn't be as spectacular as you might think necessarily unless you were really unlucky. Um, there is so much gas and dust in the plane of our galaxy that, uh, okay, so if the Milky Way ignites as a quasar, uh, let's not go super luminous quasar, let's go Seifert galaxy like might happen uh, after the merger of Andromeda. All right. Um, you might be able to see something um, well, it'd still be fairly dark if all that gas and dust is still there. But even if that gas and dust were removed, you might see something 
um, with a brightness comparable to the moon. So it would be pretty bright, but it wouldn't be so bright, it would be overwhelming. Now, there are jets, these, these powerful relativistic, relativistic, close to the speed of light jets that come out of uh, some 10% of quasars. And it turns out when we look at galaxies with quasars and jets, they're not always um, aligned with the disk of a galaxy. The angles are somewhat arbitrary. And that disk can plow out into the, uh, the disk of a galaxy. And um, these things are disruptive and can ignite star formation. And if they're pointed right at you, it's bad news. <laughs> so um, I, I think that would be a, a major problem. And um, certainly, if you had a, a quasar in the center of a galaxy, that environment, I think, would be very uh, unhappy for local life. Um, so maybe in the outer parts of a galaxy, it might be okay. But if you saw the movie Interstellar, mm -hmm. uh, Interstellar has a supermassive black hole. They call it Gargantua, something like uh, 100 million solar masses. It's big. Um, it's luminous, but they, they said this is an anemic quasar. The accretion disk around it is fairly anemic. And still, it's variable. It's luminous. You would not want to live in a planet that's anywhere close to that black hole uh, that's accreting at any level. Um, so while I love seeing a supermassive black hole in the movie Interstellar, uh, I just I just kind of watch that and I go, that is the stupidest place to think about relocating humans. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is not a life happy environment. Uh, just, just don't go there. So quasars and even supermassive black holes are are generally not good places to be, even though we're not talking about falling into one. Because as you point out, that's that's actually really hard to do. But just the radiation environment right. al alone, even for as you call them an anemic quasar, right, or an anemic black hole, one that's really not doing the whole quasar thing. Just sitting there gobbling up, so you know, dining on, snacking on some local gas. That's enough radiation to ruin your day. It, it absolutely is, and 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 just even at the simplest level, we're currently concerned about climate change, um, the change in our surface temperature of a fraction of a percent over a few decades, uh, maybe a little bit larger over a little bit more time. It's very disruptive to our, our ecosystem and our sea levels and all kinds of things. Well, these accretion disks are really variable. You know, we regularly see um, 10, 20% variability over the course of a year. Of a year, 10 or 20%. Uh, this is just a ridiculous place to uh, have a habitable world um, where you're close enough that uh, you're getting your your sunshine effectively and, and your heating from the secretion disk. So again, bad bad place to be. <laughs> Actually though, uh, you know, this was another, this sort of dovetails into this question. Uh, what would it be like to be a civilization that relies on a quasar for energy as we rely on the sun? I mean, is there any scenario where you could, you know, get away with it? So it was suggested uh, we have a rogue planet, okay? Okay. Probably planets are thrown out of young star systems mm -hmm. and can fly through space. Let's imagine we have one in the core of a galaxy near a, a quasar. Well, probably any living creatures want to be underground, shielded from all of that variable radiation. But you could also imagine if you had some way of harvesting... Um, solar energy in effect there would be plenty of energy for you all the time um yeah um, and, and and uh 28 acetine uh sent us a very generous super sticker with a frowny face sorry it's uh, you know so you know if you're lucky enough to live near a quasar you could maybe stick a little telescope out the ground and get a glimpse of it. I don't know. <laughs> but thank you for the super sticker. Appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Plenty of photons to study. 
you would have plenty of photons, right? So uh, there's a couple, so many questions here, guys. I'm going to try to get to as many of them as I can here. Uh, but uh, the one thing I wanted, uh, let's see. Oh, where was it? Where was it? Uh, here's an interesting question from, uh, you know, do you ever see quasars colliding or interacting? Because you talk about We're galaxies colliding. Over. What about quasars colliding? So, yeah, um, this would be what we would call a binary quasar. So there are certainly interacting galaxy systems where both galaxies have activity at their nuclei, and you could call it binary quasars. I, I found one. There are dozens of these that have been identified. Um, but we think what must happen when you merge galaxies is that eventually the black holes merge, and that process is not well understood. But we have some evidence coming in from uh, uh, something called pulsar timing arrays that find very low frequency gravitational waves uh, that are emitted from binary quasars on subparsec scales. Parsec is about three and a quarter light years. And I'm actively involved uh, with studies with our, our telescope here in Wyoming, uh, WIRO, trying to find these binary quasars. And a lot of people are trying to find them. We think they ought to exist where we're in the last stages of um, merging black holes, where the final stages, um, the, the orbits, if you will, decay from gravitational radiation. But we think that a lot of times these close black holes should be active. They can't be very common, probably, but we think they should be out there and it would be super cool to find them. So this is, this is really an active area of research right now. And I'll just repeat myself again. We think that they exist, we're looking for them. That would be cool. That seems like a reasonable uh, explanation. I mean, we know what we know and we don't know what we don't know. So yeah. Um, now. Shameless plug, I just did a video about a uh, discovery of a pair of binary quasars or double quasars. And um, I guess one of the big problems or the big questions are, is how do you know what you're seeing is really two separate quasars or some other phenomenon like a gravitational lens where the light from a single quasar is being bent into two images, right? Yeah, um, so the... So I, I called it a binary. It's common to call it a binary in the 90s. Mm -hmm. But we now call them double quasars, where they're at distance of, of kiloparsecs, not light years. Um, and in, in the case of that one, I knew it was a, there were two quasars there because one had radio jets and the other didn't. Whereas with gravitational lensing, um, gravitational lensing is in wavelength independent. You should see the same quasar, and it should look essentially identical um, although there's a slight time delay between the two light paths. So you would see the same quasar at, at two slightly different times. Slightly different meaning probably years. Hmm. Very cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, the questions are coming in fast and fierce, and uh, we're, we're starting to come toward the end of our hour here. So maybe we could do a couple quick questions, uh, somewhat rapid fire-ish. I'll, uh, I'll see if we can get through uh, as many of these as possible. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, rapid fire. How many times brighter is the beacon compared to the luminosity of the accretion disk? Thank you. So how do we def how do we distinguish a beacon from lumina from the accretion disk? Let's see. Uh, beacons referring to the dark beacon of the title of uh, our event tonight. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe uh, if we can get a clarification on that question. We can come back to it. Uh, how is it that the quasars can be fed so consistently? Do consistent streams of gas form from the spiral, or does a quasar just end up in the gaseous patch of the universe? Yeah, so they're not fed consistently. Mm -hmm. They're variable. It changes over time. Um, it's consistent maybe on the time scale of, of a human lifetime or years, but over longer time scales, it's not at all. And it's probably very episodic and driven by the galaxy interaction and galaxy mergers. So up and down, up and down, up and down. It's, it's not steady. Um, and one thing that can fuel some of these quasars and nuclear activity, the supermassive black holes, is what's called a tidal disruption event, hmm. where a star passes too close to the event horizon of the black hole and is torn apart and shredded 
and can form um, a short-lived accretion disk, and it will look similar to a quasar. All right, very cool. And then we have, uh, well, I think you, I think this may have already been addressed, uh, Daniel, at the risk of repeating your question, uh, but uh, of the quasars we know of, how many are of a greater luminosity than the Milky Way? Seems like, from what, you, from what I understand, Mike, seems like just about all of them, right? So, so quasar these days has a definition that's based on luminosity. Mm -hmm. And the answer is all of the quasars are more luminous than the Milky Way. Absolutely. Uh, when they get more, uh, when they get fainter compared to the Milky Way luminosity, we start calling them Seifert galaxies. Mm -hmm. So all of the quasars are more luminous. And then, um, by and then definition, you have just lower luminosity versions. By definition, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and Dustin asks, are these quasars more common in the early universe when the universe was young, uh, with an abundance of matter compared to now? And how did these supermassive black holes form only in the early universe? Ooh, that's a so, that's a million dollar question right there, isn't it? Well, we have an understanding of this, and and we're trying to understand this better with uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Quasars were not that as common in the beginning of the universe. That at cosmic dawn, we start to see them. But quasars are more common at what we call cosmic noon, redshifts of two to three, when the universe was um, something like uh, nine or 10 billion years old. And they're not common at all today. So, so a little common, more increasingly common, sort of in our middle history of the universe when the galaxies are interacting and merging and the most massive galaxies are, are uh, evolving and building, that's when the quasars were most common. So, so we have cosmic dawn, yeah, something like this, uh, cosmic noon, and then the local universe. So the population of quasars has, we say it's evolved very dramatically. Not so common, increasingly common, and then not so common again today. So... We're sort of past the quasar epoch, although lower mass galaxies are still merging and we still have a lot of Seifert galaxy activity, low luminosity quasars. Excellent. Okay. Uh, am, I, am I unmuted? Yes, I am unmuted. Okay, good. <laughs> still trying. I'm, I'm still learning how to live stream, folks, so uh, pardon me. Uh, let's see. There's a, there's a really good question, uh, and it had to do with uh, classifying quasars. And I'm probably just going to miss it. Uh, I'm scrolling through trying to find it. But basically, uh, if I remember correctly, the question was something like, oh, here it is. Arjuna asked, are the quasars classified by brightness or angle toward us? Absolutely. Um, so we've already talked about quasars versus Seifert galaxies, mm -hmm. which has to do with how intrinsically luminous they are. But uh, there's another um, part of the classification scheme, the quasar zoo, or the uh, active galaxy zoo that depends on the angle. Uh, as you as you've seen, we have um, a system axis, a spin axis, characterized by these jets in the radial out systems. But just because the accretion appears to be uh, in the form of a disk means that when the system, when we see that disk, they're the brightest. But when they're edge on, and and we think those disks extend out into something we call the dusty torus. And the dusty torus uh, in the plane of that disk can hide them from our sight. Uh, so that if we're not looking down at the disk face on, we're seeing it more edge on, they're faint. And we call them, a, astronomy is terrible this way. We have type 1 objects and type 2 objects. Like we have type 1 supernova and type 2 supernova. Type 1, population 1A star, 1 stars and supernova type 1 and supernova type 2. So you have... AGN type 1 and AGN type 2, whether or not you're seeing that disk directly or not. Yeah, the whole classification schemes and orientation uh, issues are, are a big part of the study. That's fantastic. And uh, let's see, we had, a, we had another super sticker coming in from Andrew Waldy. Thank you so much, Andrew. Lemon character taking his sunglasses off and raising his arm to greet someone. Imitated by baby. Okay, it's in the super sticker, guys. Ta just take a look in the in the comment. Take a look in the chats and see that it's a cutest little thing. I just wish Ecam, please allow us to see these gorgeous super stickers, uh, so that our guests can see them and enjoy them as well. Now, uh, there is something. Uh, okay, well, 
Uh, this is a, a, a really good uh, question here, and I apologize if I'm just scrolling up here. I'm trying to find it. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, Arjuan asked, Will the LISA mission be able to tell quasar collisions from regular large black hole collisions? Wow, okay, so first of all, we should probably define what the LISA mission is. And then, will yeah, you be able to tell anything? Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, LISA is a space-based gravitational wave mission. Mm -hmm. um, going to space lets you stabilize a lot of things, get longer baselines. Um, so, what we've been able to find with ground-based uh, LIGO uh, and gravitational wave telescopes is uh, the mergers of relatively small black holes. They happen fast, they have large amplitudes um, and, and, and high frequencies. Um, everything slows down with supermassive black holes. The size scales are larger, uh, the time scales are longer. Um, and essentially the, the wavelengths or the frequencies are, are, are longer and slower for the gravitational waves as well. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't know what the predictions are for the frequencies of supermassive black hole mergers, but they're going to be a lot less common than um, the smaller black hole mass mergers. The small ones happen in binary systems um, and you'll have many per galaxy. Whereas uh, the supermassive black hole mergers, you will only have rarely when you have the merger of large galaxies with a long delay um, followed by the merger of these supermassive black holes. So we know that the supermassive black holes do exist in binaries. We can see them in low frequency gravitational waves and we're trying to find them uh, in other wavelengths and other signatures. So it's, so I think the answer is, I don't know for sure, but uh, I don't think Lisa is going to be able to see directly uh, quasar collisions. Okay, fair enough. And just, we got another really nice super sticker from uh, Chris Construction Cronies. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Keep it up, it says, among a pair character. <laughs> Lifting up. I got I, I to gotta go back and see what these things look like. <laughs> but I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's adorable uh, <laughs> beyond comprehension. But thank you. Um, you know, I, I think uh, it, we're kind of really just at, at the end of our time here. And, and this has just been super cool to talk about. I know quasars are clearly the... Uh, well, I think they really are the most... It seems like they are the most energetic objects in the universe, right? The the biggest the biggest bang since the big one, right? Yeah, you could make an argument for gamma ray bursts, but gamma ray bursts are are biased in the sense they're probably a, a kind of supernova where the jet's pointed right at us. Okay. And relativistic effects amplify the apparent luminosity of those objects. But if you want to say quasars are the most luminous extreme objects that are not exploding, okay. And uh, Nicholas Paulson, with another generous super, super chat. Thank you so much. Thank you for another very interesting live stream. Please consider earlier start time if possible for us Europeans by sleep habits would be grateful. You know, you're right. I, I, I probably should do this more often and try to try to do them earlier in the day. Uh, so I'll see if I can't weave uh, some earlier uh, uh, live streams in because you guys need to sleep too and you deserve that but thank you very much nicholas really do appreciate it uh we had uh let's see oh and thank you sharon it's been fascinating thank you both thank you sharon and uh also arjuan is saying thank you very much dr brotherton yes indeed and uh, i can tell you uh that uh you know guys you know there's a reason why this guy is my main man on the main sequence even though what he studies are not on the main sequence because you know he's brilliant and he is just a great guy to have and by the way he actually runs a little thing called the launchpad astronomy workshop mike can you tell us about that in just a couple of minutes please yeah the launchpad astronomy workshop for writers was something uh, i came up with about 15 years ago uh that would help me merge my interests in professional astronomy and science fiction and, uh, you know, there's not that many astronomers who are 
professional science fiction writers. There's not that many professional science fiction writers who are professional scientists. So I wanted to put those things together and see what I could make out of that. And um, the workshop was originally funded by NASA. It's been funded by the Hubble Space Telescope. It's been funded by the Science Fiction Writers of America. But uh, basically every summer for a week in Wyoming, um, we, we bring in uh, professional science fiction writers and give them a crash course in astronomy and some uh, pointers about communicating science to the general public. And it's a little self-serving. Uh, I want to prevent the next Armageddon because that movie had terrible science. And it's hard for me to watch terrible science in my science fiction movies. So, um, and, and people learn from TV and movies. They may be like, oh, I, I, I know that's just a movie. I shouldn't pay attention to that. But, you know, advertising works, and we assimilate the material that we watch and listen to. So the idea is we, we want to inspire the next generation of scientists and try to get better science into our entertainment. So, um, you know, people who write move, who write books and, and stories and TV shows, and um, we've had a lot of award-winning, best-selling writers come to Launchpad over the years. And uh, about half that time period, Christian has been my, my right-hand man. Um, sorry for you lefties. But my that's right a, that's man, okay. I, I'm I'm on that. I'm on your right, as seen from your perspective on the screen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He's my right hand man. Sure. Uh, and uh, we, we have uh, similar um, passions about astronomy and sharing it with the public and trying trying to get people to to know the real stuff and to be inspired about how incredibly interesting the universe is. So anyway. Launchpad Astronomy originally came from the name of that workshop, right? And uh, and then I shamelessly the workshop, and I shamelessly yeah. ripped it off uh, to make it the title of this YouTube channel. But you told me you told me to do that, so I'm you know I'm just following totally orders. Okay. I'm following orders, boss. You know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and you know we're gonna try to do another workshop. We don't know. We're still trying to figure out if we can do it this year. Maybe, kind of fingers crossed. You know, but if you're a writer. And, and again, it's not just that you have to be a science fiction writer. If you're a creative professional of any stripe, a writer, an editor, a, a screenwriter, an artist, uh, you know, a filmmaker, we're going to try to see if we can get you into a workshop and we'll make an announcement when we think we can have some dates set up. If not this year, almost certainly, well, for almost certainly next year. But we'll see if we can do something because Mike and I miss doing it. And uh, it, it, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of work for us, but it's also a lot of fun as well. So uh, I do want to say thank you so much, and thank you very much, uh, Junk Mail. Quite brilliant. Really do appreciate that very kindly. And oh, thank you, Dustin. So good to have you here, and thank you so much for uh, liking and subscribing. And thank you, Amy. Art and science should never be mutually exclusive. Agreed, 100. percent You know, we learn from our art as much as we learn from our science. So. Let's get it good, right? Let's get it right. And thank you, Callie. Hearts and, to and you Let as me well. just say, uh, uh, one of the things that makes our civilization, I think, worthwhile, and one of the reasons to fund basic sciences like astronomy, is it elevates all of us, I think, to know what our universe is like, how old it is, how big it is, what are the amazing things in it. And it's hard to put a dollar value on that. Mm -hmm. It's, um, mm -hmm. I think it's worthwhile, and it makes my life worthwhile and it's what i've dedicated myself to do oh, I'm, gl I'm glad you're doing it mike and, I, and i'm glad that we got to uh uh meet via the uh, workshop uh, actually we we actually met via a science fiction convention that we were both invited to as guests uh 10 years ago this year mike so we've been oh wow yeah we've been doing <laughs> this for a while yeah so anyway thank you very much and thank you so much uh once again, for the W900 from 21 Bez. Okay, 100 underlined twice. 100 underlined twice. 100 underlined twice. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And thank you, Pan. By the way, uh, Pan over here, he was the chair at WindyCon the year that Mike and I met. So thank you, Pan, for introducing Mike and I. Now, friends, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. We've gone way past our time, and I do apologize for that. But I do want to thank, once again, Mike for 
coming by and joining us tonight and talking about quasars. It is such an exciting topic and I want to thank all of you and particularly my Patreon supporters who are helping look at these beautiful attractive intelligent and even socially well-adjusted people i'm just looking at the wall but anyway you know what i'm seeing right so thank you so much and if you'd like to help support launchpad for the price of a cup of coffee you can do so you can visit my uh, patreon page at patreon.com it all helps to keep the lights on and of course if you'd like to join me on this journey through this incredible universe of ours well please make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new videos until next time my friends Stay healthy and stay curious, my friends. Good night.